Boa noite, alunos, alunas, professores, técnicos administrativos da Universidade Franciscana. Uh, entramos agora, então, na nossa última noite do nosso seminário do Ciel, promovido pelo mestrado em Ensino de Humanidades e Linguagem da Universidade Franciscana. Eu gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos, uh, agradecer a presença também da professora Annabelle Luckin, que aceitou gentilmente o convite para falar sobre escolha na linguagem e as ideologias na guerra. Então, vou fazer uma apresentação rápida da professora Annabelle. A professora Annabelle é professora associada de linguística da Macquarie University. Os seus interesses de pesquisa incluem o estudo da linguagem na política, mídia, saúde e literatura. Em 2019, ela publicou o livro Guerra e Suas Ideologias, Teoria Sociemiótica e Descrição, um livro baseado em 15 anos de pesquisa em como a linguagem legitima algumas formas de violência enquanto estigmatiza outras. Os interesses de Annabelle estão em contribuir para um melhor entendimento público sobre a natureza e o poder da linguagem. Uh, ela já foi entrevistada em rádios públicos e comerciais e tem contribuído para um número significativo de artigos ao jornal The Conversation. A professora Anabelle combina análise de discurso com métodos de linguística de corpos. Ela é afiliada do Sydney Corpus, Corpus Lab. Ela é membro também do Communicators de Clare, uma organização de comunicações, relações públicas e profissionais de marketing que tem uh, who have declared, né? Que se declararam que eles não trabalharão para organizações que promovem ou trabalham em instituições que poluem ou utilizam uh, 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 polluting fossil fuels, né? Ou seja, o... Desculpa, gente, meu my English failed. Mas usando uh, poluentes, ok? So, Professor Annabelle, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my slides with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I've sadly never visited Brazil. Um, so, This is my first ever presentation to a Brazilian audience and I'm really delighted uh, to be here with you today. So I decided that I would give a paper on this title on choice in language, ideologies of war and violence. So I have spent I don't know, 15, 16 years, something like that, working on this project. And I will say a little bit about the background to the project. Um, of course, the issues about war and ideology are of interest to many disciplines. And so I'll also mention some really important work in sociology that has really influenced the way I think about these issues. But of course, primarily for me, I'm investigating these problems from a linguistic point of view. And as I've applied linguistic theories to the problem of ideology, it's become so clear to me that language is always ideological and ideology is part of life because language is, is part of life. Language is everywhere. We do so many things with language. We can't get away from language. And the whole organization of language is a reflection of its ideological potential. So I've come to see that, that issues about ideology and language are completely inseparable. And so part of what I've looked at is I've tried to look at this both from a theoretical lens and from an applied lens, an empirical lens. So I've looked at different data sets around the, the way in which war, in fact, the word war is used 
but I've also tried to think about it in theoretical terms and about how things like the motif of choice, which is so fundamental to the whole organisation of language, is, is a big part of why language is ideological and why language is so powerful. So I'm doing a little, little bit of theory and a little bit of um, empirical presentation in this paper today. Uh, okay, so as I say, this, this project uh, I've been involved in for 15 or more years. It started when I was lucky enough to get a postdoctoral position at Macquarie, um, and I was very interested in the way in which the 2003 invasion of Iraq was being reported on Australia's public broadcaster, but in other media as well. And eventually, I published a book that combined this theoretical and descriptive analysis of ideologies around war and violence. Uh, I think in the introduction, Eric mentioned that I write for non-academic uh, audiences. And so I have also tried to uh, reach other people with the findings of this work. Um, and on the slide, you can see a couple of columns that I've written. Um, the bottom one, the most recent one that I wrote at the time that there was sadly more violence um, in uh, Israel and Palestine. <coughs> and I wrote about the way in which the media can, is often complicit in defending the powerful belligerents um, in reporting things like this kind of violence. Um, and the, the, the other column I wrote when uh, there was a whole lot of, there was a big blow up on Twitter about the way the New York Times was also reporting the killing of Palestinians. So I'm interested in trying to reach beyond my little linguistic academic audience with this work. Just give me a sec, I'm gonna put my desk up so I can just get out of this chair. Um, okay, so as I'm doing that, excuse the interruption. Uh, on the slide here, I've got the copy of a book called The Sociology of War and Violence. So I mentioned that the issue of how we think and talk about violence is of interest in other disciplines. And uh, I discovered this work one day just browsing in my library at work. Um, and it's an absolutely fascinating sociological account of the rise of violence in modernity uh, and how it is that as we've become a more enlightened people, as we've come to have more and more discourses around fundamental human rights, as we've developed a commitment and a belief in the right to life, we've also developed more uh, bureaucratised, militarised societies, and we've developed the most lethal technology that humans have ever had. So Milesevich, who's the author of this and other books on organised violence, he talks a lot about nationalism and argues, in fact, that nationalism is the most powerful ideology that humans have ever invented because it's a deep uh, rationalising ideology for geopolitical violence. Um, so I, I take a lot of um, ideas from this work and it's helped me understand things like why it is that war, while it appears to be characterised by violence, let me just 
pop to the next slide. So if you look up the concept of war on Wikipedia, you will see this little explanation. Uh, so Wikipedia tells us, among other things, that war is characterised by extreme violence, aggression, destruction and mortality. Now, um, I don't think that's at all surprising or controversial to describe war in those terms. But is that how we talk about war? Is that how we report war? And one of the things I found that still shocks me is that these two concepts, war and violence, which we know go hand in hand, are in fact very separated in discourses around war. Of course, all of my data is English, so I can't make a claim for any other language. Now, to give you an example of what seems to be this profound cognitive dissonance, in fact, Milosevic, who I just mentioned, he says this dissonance is so deep that he calls it an ontological dissonance. So there's something deep in European culture that abhors war and sees war as, you know, and violence as terrible and, and so on. At the same time, we love war and in war we invest uh, our tales of bravery and courage and striving and purpose and renewal. So we've got these deep cultural antipathies to violence at the same time that we maintain this profound commitment and belief in war as a means to something better. And it, it makes no sense at all. This is why Milosevic calls it an ontological dissonance. Now, the headline that I've got on my screen there, it was published uh, by the ABC, which is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. It's Australia's version of the BBC, so built on the BBC model. Um, I mention that to you because in Australia, we have so much of our media owned by the Murdoch Press, and it is a cancer on Australia's democracy. Okay, so this is the public broadcaster. Okay, so we've got a headline here from 2016, a report from the Syrian war. Now, I'm sure many of you know that this has been something of a proxy war, so a war based in Syria, but with the involvement of many outside players, countries, such as the US and Russia. In 2016, uh, American and Russian leaders got together and they agreed to a ceasefire, as the headline says. So US and Russia clinch ceasefire plan. Now, to me, a ceasefire means people stop fighting, they stop firing, they stop using their weapons. That's what a ceasefire is. But you can see the second part of the headline is that the US and Russia will launch joint strikes if truce holds, okay? So in this little headline, we can have a concept of a ceasefire or a truce which doesn't involve the violence that will go on to be perpetrated by the US and Russia in this context. So it's as if the idea of the two superpowers launching strikes that will inevitably kill people, that won't undermine a truce or a ceasefire. So this kind of weird tension between these ideologies, on the one hand, 
this belief in human life and the right to human life and a belief in human rights. On the other hand, uh, in all kinds of ways, the power of the powerful, the, their, their rights to use the violent technology that they have is consistently legitimated. Okay, so as I started to try and think through this, I realised at some point that the concept that I needed to interrogate was the meaning of the word war. Now, this was something that I took completely for granted as a, a, as a non-ideological word. And after a while, it became clear to me that, of course, the words that we overlook are often the words that are doing the most ideological work. So along the way in this project, I wondered about the conjunction of these words that I've got on the slide here. So the expression fought and died, which of course means to sacrifice yourself for some greater good, to give your life in the service of something, versus fought and killed. Okay, fought and died versus fought and killed. Now, grammatically, we've got a distinction here, right? To die is to do something yourself, uh, to do something that only affects you. To kill, which is what we call a transitive verb, obviously means you do an action that affects somebody else. And one of the things I discovered over time was the semantics around a word like killing what we call a transitive verb, okay, so this idea that the actions you take impact on something or somebody else, the, these don't sit comfortably with the concept of war. So there's a whole lot of ways we talk about war in which we manage to avoid the idea that war is lethal, that war is destructive, that war is violent. Okay, we've got this kind of ideological boundary between war on the one hand and violence on the other. We can see it in this slide. So what you're looking at is a graph from the Google Books corpus. Uh, so it's a corpus of English but other languages as well and it's got billions and billions of words in it. And it's also what we call a diachronic corpus. That is, it's got data over a time period, starting from the 1800s all the way up to 2019. So the blue line shows you fought and died. And you can see it tracking, increasing over time and tracking. The first peak is, the first big peak is World War I, the second big peak is World War II. So this phrase, fought and died, is increasing in periods of intense war or, as Milosevic would call it, organised violence. The conjunction of fought and killed does not follow this path. So if I could get in and show it to you a bit closer, I'd be able to demonstrate that to you a little bit better. Okay, But the red line for fought and killed is on a different track. So the context for fought and killed are very different for the context for fought and died. Now, if I come back to this question of choice, on the one hand, of course, as a speaker, you can choose whether you say fought and died or fought and killed, but context exerts a pressure. It creates expectations. And people go with the flow. They follow the norms of what is going on around them. And this is a, a, a principle that I will pick up through the course of this um, discussion today. Okay, that was just a little bit of background. Okay, so I'm going to move through these four uh, points 
uh, in my outline. The notion of choice, I want to talk a bit about the nature of the linguistic sign because it's important to understand, to be able to understand why language is so ideological. Then I'm going to talk about the concept of war, definitions, what it looks like in the thesaurus, and I'm going to use some corpus linguistic tools. And then I just want to have some reflections on this concept of choice. And essentially what I'm going to argue is, you, you know, when you choose the word war, you bring a whole lot of other things with that word that you don't consciously choose, okay? You're stuck with all of the cultural, historical semantics and baggage of that word. So on the one hand, you exercise a choice, but that choice comes with a whole lot of things that you don't choose as an individual because words only work because everybody's using them and that creates a whole lot of associations that build up over time. Okay, so um, we can reflect on this question ourselves as individual users of language. What, you know, what does it feel like to choose when we're involved in the act of speaking? And of course, most of it, most of the time, we do very unconsciously. And this is because language is just so complex. It wouldn't work if you stopped and consciously made every single choice consciously in your head. Okay, your brain allows you to process things in a very unconscious way. I'm very influenced by the work of Halliday, uh, a British linguist who ended up in Australia in the 1970s. He was the first chair of linguistics at the University of Sydney. Um, and I read a lot of his work and, as I say, I'm very influenced by a lot of his ideas. And I love the way he shows us how complex this act of choice is. So he says choice, meaning choice when we speak, is like taking part in an evolutionary process in which the totality of semiotic activities on the one hand maintains and supports the existing eco-social order while at the same time, on the other hand, nudging it in the directions in which that eco-social order is going to change is, in fact, already changing. Okay, it gives you a sense of the weight of the, of the individual act of creating a text. And he signals to us that every moment of speaking references what's gone before us, is part of being in a particular moment, but is also taking language and the culture in the direction in which it's already moving. So we get this sense that, okay, we choose as individuals, but in the context of it's like a river that's flowing and we've got to step in there and use a bit of this language in the process of this cultural flow. Okay, so let's get a bit closer to the question of choice. We know that we get choices about a particular word. And on the slide, I've, I've looked up a, an online thesaurus, which is going to show us some synonyms for the word war. You can see some of those battle combat, conflict. So, of course, these words are similar, but they're never exactly the same. Uh, so these exist in a little kind of cluster of related meanings, but each is a unique uh, set of meanings within that field. Okay. At the same time, we exercise grammatical choice. Uh, now, um, I know that diagrams are very, is very small on that slide and difficult to see the details of it. The point here is that 
words have to fit into grammatical structures. So at the same time that we are choosing words, we're making choices in grammatical paradigms, okay, and the network representation I've got there shows this idea that grammar is a set of options for speakers to choose from. And we can choose, for instance, to say the war has begun. Okay, grammatically that's choosing what we call middle voice. Okay, the war has begun as if it's begun all by itself. Or I can say something like the war is killing civilians where I've got effective voice, active voice, a transitive clause. Okay, now I've constructed the war as having agency and impacting on something else. So these grammatical choices are also going on constantly as we produce text. Okay, so I jumped into this problem of how war, how the invasion of Iraq was being reported by getting some data from Australia's Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, and I got a little two-week sample from the, the, it's hard to say the beginning of the war because the bombing of Baghdad had already started. It's kind of like the official declared beginning of this invasion. So that was the 20th of March, 2003. And you can see on my slide how the ABC was representing this supreme act of violence by the US, the UK, and sadly by Australia as well. So the TV announcers say the war against Iraq begins. Okay, so choosing to call it war and choosing middle voice, that is choosing to represent the beginnings of this violence as if it's just a war beginning. And in that act, you can see the perpetrators of the violence are completely invisible. So, so I got interested in this, in the semantics of this and what it meant as a kind of overall uh, ideological orientation to the concept of war. So a little reminder, as I say, most of us see war as characterised by extreme violence, and yet do we find these concepts coming together? Okay, let's have a little look into the nature of the sign or the word. And I just want to talk about a couple of principles that come from Saussure, the Swiss linguist, often described as the father of, of modern linguistics um, and very famous for this concept of the sign. And Saussure argued there were two key principles that were just fundamental to the whole way that meaning works in language. First of all, the sign is arbitrary. Okay, also that we, we sometimes describe that as conventional. And what that means is we can combine any meaning and any sound together. So arbitrary means we can use any sound. We can call it war, we can call it guerra or, you know, any of the other ways that we've come up with a sound to link to that concept. Okay, it seems like a very simple principle, but the arbitrariness of the sign means you only learn it by stepping into the language of those around you, okay? You have to agree to all of the combinations that are part of the language that you are or the languages that you are born into. And that means you are subject to all of the cultural conventions, the cultural assumptions, the cultural ideologies that are part of how 
those particular meanings have come to be shaped in the culture that you step into. That is a function of the arbitrariness of the sign. The sign is also linear. What does that mean? Well, words only work in the context of other words. You, when you speak, one word follows another word, okay? And in that process, they are uh, put into structures. They define the local context of each other. They influence each other. So the meaning of a word is part of the neighbourhood of words that go around it. Okay, so these two principles of the sign are a deep part of the, the openness of language. We can constantly invent new things. Um, at the same time, that it makes language coercive. You have to come into the cultural arrangements and the cultural assumptions that have gone before you. Okay, you have to be part of this conventional agreement about what meanings we're going to make and how we're going to make those meanings. Okay, so let's have a look at the sign in practice. I've got a little set of concordance lines there from the British National Corpus where I searched up the word war. Okay, now this corpus is 100 million words of British English from the early 1990s. It's what we call a multi-generic corpus. So it's samples of language from many different uh, contexts. And this allows us to make generalisations about English rather than English in a particular context of use. Okay, so you can see my key lexical item there in blue. And I've just put a little list on the right-hand side of the word war with L1, as in one word to the left. And it's just a little sample. Uh, and what do we see? Well, we see Cold War, of War, Gulf War, Civil War, okay? Uh, the War, World War make war, Spanish war, etc. So these are just unremarkable little samples of natural discourse, of natural contexts in which this concept of war is used. But already we can start to see some things about the habitual linguistic patterns for using this concept. For a start, you can see that the word war gets to be part of a proper noun. Okay, so we've got capital C, cold, capital W, war, or capital G, gulf, capital W, war, or world war, Spanish war. And what does that mean? It means that war can be something specific. So we can talk not just about war as a general state of being, but we can talk about specific, a specific war, okay? So as a noun, war is both a countable and an uncountable noun. Gives it a lot of flexibility. As a count countable noun, it can be narrativized. It can be named so that we can identify some period of organised violence, we can give it a label, we can give it a personal name, and then it can be the subject of narrativisation. There are some scholars who say the discipline of history was born through a drive to create stories about war. And we can see a little bit of that reactance even in this little sample that we see here. Okay, if I take one to the right, we can see war and, war many, war was, war to, war of, war with, war worry, war work, war started, war progressed, war office. Again, just a simple little sample. But it's starting to tell us some things. We can see here again 
what I mentioned before about the idea of war and the semantics of middle voice, okay? The war started, the war progressed, okay? It's as if war is its own little thing that has its own, is, is on its own kind of trajectory, okay? And in that construction, the humans who are perpetrating this violence are not made visible. We can also see some compound words, okay? We have war worries, war work, war office, war effort, war time, okay? So that's starting to indicate something as well and I'll come back to that point in a moment. Okay, um, I've taken a sample across another corpus, the news on the web corpus, and it's reiterating some of these principles I've already mentioned. Uh, and indeed, we can look at something like the corpus of American soap opera. Now, all of these are public, publicly available corpora. Um, if there's time for some questions and you want to ask me about them, please do. Okay, so in all of these different contexts, we can see standard formulations around this concept and we can start to get a profile of how speakers use this word and here are some of the uh, patterns that we can see that start to tell us about the significance of this word culturally okay we can see it both as noun and adjective so we can have the war and we can have war baby as I mentioned, it's a proper noun and subject to narrativisation. <coughs> Pardon me. War it can be taxonomised. Okay, so we have different types of war, trade war, caste war, sustained war. Uh, war is a state of being. I mentioned that it can be a, an uncountable noun, so we can simply be at war. Okay, so it's a state of being. And again, the humans who create this violence are uh, absent. <clears throat> war is partitive, okay? So we get this uh, conjunction of of and war, so something of war, and this is a very common formulation, and it's because war is this, has become this enormous, complex thing in our culture that's just got so many parts to it. And of course, war is intransitive, typically intransitive. Even though that makes no sense at all, if we say war is associated with violence, destruction, aggression, etc., these are all transitive things because they create an impact, they have an impact. But that's not how we use this word. This word. Okay, so let's just... Um, take a few more samples around this concept of war and I've come to use this metaphor when I think about this. I'm sure you're all familiar with the periodic table and the elements of the periodic table and they all have certain kinds of properties, atomic weight, you know, numbers of electrons, etc. and they have their own location in the periodic table. And I've started to get it to use this metaphor to understand the properties of a word that's so sociological significant like the word war. And I've contrasted it with the word violence, which it should be very close to. But as I keep saying, it's like if we think about the, the uh, you know, the two different poles of a magnet that to, those magnets will repel each other. This is what's going on around the concept of war and the concept of violence. Okay, so let's have a look at a few other things about the use of the word war. Okay, so if we try and define it, we remember the linear character of the sign, that is words only work in context. So to define war, we have to go and find other words. We don't have any other way of defining it. 
And we certainly can't use indexicality to define war. What I mean by that is, if you look at some violence going on, can you say, well, that's war? Well, somebody else can come along and say, well, no, that's a war crime. That's an act of aggression. That's a crime of aggression. And, of course, this is something that is part of the role of the United Nations to try and explain or defend when this kind of violence is legal under international law and when it's illegal under international law. And this is a whole nother debate uh, and I've started to do some work on this field, in this field actually, to look at the way war and violence is constructed in international law. And the boundary is not clear at all, okay? So things that we, that we call aggression or that we determine to be illegal under international law look very, very similar to the things that have the legitimating force of the Geneva Conventions and so on, these other treaties in international law. Okay, so this is what it means to say we can't use indexicality to define war. So the Oxford English Dictionary gives us a definition like this. How does it do that? Well, it defines war as hostile contention. Contention is a much more abstract kind of category. Um, we can see there's a principle of organisation. Okay, so it's carried out by armed forces, carried on by nation states and so on. So it's got a bureaucratic character. And importantly, it's defined as something that's bi-directional. Okay, so in war you have two parties in a fight against each other. And this is part of the legitimating semantics of war. When we label something as war, we treat the two parties of it as both equally engaged in the violence. Now, I myself try very hard to avoid the word war, and this is one of the reasons. It's very, very hard to avoid it, I, I, I can tell you, because it's everywhere, okay? But you will hear me talk about the invasion of Iraq, not the second Gulf War. So as much as possible, I try and avoid that word because of all of this, these kinds of semantics that are tied up in it, okay? So there's a definition for you. Uh, and if you look deeper into that definition in the Oxford English Dictionary, you will see that war has nearly 250 compound forms, okay? So we saw things like war baby, war effort, war time. Uh, there are so many different cultural domains in which we find compound words using war. And this also tells us that war is deep in English-speaking culture. Okay, it's a pervasive cultural reference point. Uh, there is a scholar in uh, the UK whose name is um, Joanna Burke, and she's written books like A History of Rape, A History of Killing, uh, a book that's a few years old now called Deep Violence, she argues that there has been a profound militarisation of Western cultures. And this is some linguistic evidence for her claim. If we look at war in the thesaurus, we see this very interesting and very clear separation of war from violence. So they are in quite distinct parts of the thesaurus and the thesaurus is this kind of bird's eye view of the semantic field <coughs> that the words of English relate to. <coughs> Pardon me. So violence turns up as a subcategory of bad behaviour. War is a category of armed hostility. <coughs> 
And you can see that war, uh, that sorry, that armed hostility is in a category, the overarching category is society and armed hostility is simply part of society. As much a part of society as the community, inhabiting or dwelling, authority, morality, education. So semantically, war is just part of all of these other components of society. You can see what a naturalising, normalising, validating kind of semantics we have around this concept. Okay, I'm just going to say a few more things and then wind up and hopefully have some time to take questions if we can do that in this medium. of It's new to me, so I don't quite know how it works. Um, now, the tables on this slide come from the British National Corpus, which I mentioned a little while ago. So this corpus is now 30 years old. So its language gets dated, of course. So there's all kinds of words that we would not find in this corpus because it's too old. But it is still routinely used because it's the most representative sample of English still because of the fact that it has a component of natural spoken discourse. So even though we've got much bigger corpora of English, the Google Books corpus, for example, um, that's an entirely written corpus. It's got no spoken discourse in it. Okay, so I went to this corpus to get a measure of the relative frequency of the word war. And the corpus can do that for me. So it can give me what we call a normalised frequency. So the number of words per million words for that particular lexical item. So for the word war, the normalised frequency in the British National Corpus is 276 words per million, compared with violence, which is 56 words per million. So that's a ratio of roughly five to one. The other thing this corpus can give me a measure of is text dispersion. Okay, so the British National Corpus is a sample of over 4,000 texts in all these different domains and the, the larger table separates these frequencies on the basis of these different domains. So academic prose, fiction and verse, non-academic prose and biography, newspapers, and then this, the spoken sample that's in the British National Corpus. So we can see the frequencies of these words vary by context. Language varies by context. It's a fundamental principle, not simply in the use of language, but in the whole evolution of language. Uh, war is more dominant in written discourse than in spoken discourse. And war as a lexical item is much more dispersed. So we find it across all these domains in the British National Corpus. Uh, and I've searched it across other corpora as well, across um, a variety of historical periods, just to get a kind of general sense of this frequency and relative frequency. War is also in the top 500 most frequent words of English, based on a study done by a couple of my colleagues at Lancaster University. Uh, and based on a sampling from a variety of corpora over about 40 years, okay? So highly frequent, um, disper culturally dispersed, and a um, final kind of corpus technique widely used in corpus linguistics is to look at what we call collocations, that is, what are the words that typically go on either side of a word? And uh, I've got a table that tabulates the different collocations of the word war and the word violence. 
analysed on the basis of their different grammatical functions. Now, I'm not going to go over all the details of it, except to say we can see, again, through collocations, that war and violence are completely different kinds of concepts. They have different collocations. They're turning up in different kinds of contexts. And war has a whole lot of positive or neutral collocations. Violence has largely negative collocations. Okay, so characterize, war characterised by violence? No, these are completely different con concepts. Okay, I thought that was one final step, but sorry, there was one other thing that I wanted to show you. Okay, so because we can look for collocates of, of a word, we can ask in the environment of the word war, do we find the word violence? And we can, get, you know, look, look at this across whatever data we have to hand. Now, the probability, based on the British National Corpus, the probability that the word war, that when we find the word war in a text, we will also come up against the word violence, the probability is 1.3% based on the British National Corpus. Okay? So very, very low probability. And I've done a measure of that looking at news reporting of the 2003 invasion of Iraq. And again, I find the same thing. So even in the reporting of a particular war, it's very unusual to get an association between war and violence. And if we do find the concept of violence in a news report, certainly looking at the data that I looked at, violence will be associated not with the war, but with protests. Okay, and I've got plenty of evidence to show that war collocates with the idea of an anti-war protest. Okay, so just a couple of summarising thoughts and then I'll open the floor for questions if there's, I hope there's time for questions. So uh, let me formulate the choice question in these terms. Do you use language or does it use you? Okay. And as I say, you can choose a word, but you don't choose its meanings because meanings are social and communal. You also, you don't control its frequencies and you don't control its connotations. So you choose in the context of how that word has been and is being used around you. And, of course, you are free to vary from a habitual pattern, but that will come at a cost, okay? So if you go against what everybody else is saying, you will be heard as an outlier from what is the kind of standard formulation, okay? And some further reading if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Annabelle. It's so interesting, the results you got. I mean, normally we would think that war and violence would come together, at least in some dimension or in some sort of meaning, but they don't. Now I got interested in knowing if, if that happens in uh, text in Brazilian Portuguese as well. Uh, well, I'm sure there are corpora around and the the basic techniques to look at that are really very simple. You know, now because we've got very good corpus programs, <clears throat> it would be very simple to replicate some of these um, findings or, or to replicate some of these methods that I've talked about today. Interesting. So we have a lot of questions. So from all dimensions, we have sociological questions, grammar questions, and educational questions. So let me start here. So Professor Ilsbeti, okay, she's asking where to have to translate. Peace is within us, but it is within the human spirit that wars start. What is the role of schools? I mean. Uh, schools from all, all 
from all around the world to educate. Thank you for that question. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, um, I guess what I'm trying to show is that our habits of language affect our habits of thinking and I'm trying to help people understand that we have this ontological dissonance and so the concept of war is extremely powerful and extremely legitimizing so when you label violence as war it has this veneer of legality it has a veneer of rationality of purpose of organization of striving and you know i've just put together so much evidence now that i i feel like i can see that really clearly and somehow we have to break that nexus so we have to retrieve the link between war and the profound inhumanity of it. And so I've, I'm trying to think through how it's like we've got to do a linguistic re-engineering. And when I came across the idea of organised violence, or organised brutality. So these are terms from the sociologist that I mentioned, Sinisa Milesevic. So he uses this terminology, organised violence and organised brutality. And if we change the frequency of those expressions, we might change the way people think about what war is really like and what it does. because. It seems that each generation will forget the violence of the previous generation. Uh, so I think that's part of it. Now, the problem I already know when I talk the way I talk and I use, I talk about the invasion of Iraq, I talk about soldiers fighting and killing, not fighting and dying. I know I sound ideological because I'm using less frequent ways of representing these actions and so that's going to make me sound ideological whereas the people who just follow the general community habits they don't sound ideological even though what they're doing is completely legitimating the use of violence for geopolitical ends so i guess that is that those are the terms that i would through which i would think about this problem, I'm trying to deconstruct this binary we have of good violence and bad violence. And good violence is the violence that, you know, nation states can get away with. We've got to kind of tear down that ideology somehow. The first thing that came to my mind when you were talking about trying to linguistically break the sign, I mean, culturally or through education. It's like trying to bake an atom because it's very difficult. Yeah. Very, very difficult. But it's possible. So, Professor Elsbeth has another question. Uh, so, educating for a new consciousness, able to put a term or end, an end to all violence? how to build up peace defences? Well, um, if I go back to the sociologist that I mentioned, he says the edifice of war can only be maintained through the edifice of ideology. So we now have so many forms that legitimate war. International law 
sadly, is one of those. And that's been a little bit of a, a shock to me because I assumed that international law was about putting limits on the use of violence. But as I've got more into this field and I've started to read some critical law theory, uh, I can see how law provides legitimation to the use of violence. Um, we've also got a field called, you know, military science and security studies, okay? So, you know, science is a very legitimating kind of authoritative discourse. And so it has also been recruited to create this kind of sense that war and military operations are planned, organised, rational, and, and therefore, to some degree, show an exercise of restraint, okay? And this creates another frame of legitimisation. So these discourses are just extremely powerful and, you know, we have to work out how to disentangle them and delegitimise them. And it takes, it takes a lot of work and we have to find ways that talk about this violence in different ways and, you know, create these counter discourses that change the thinking about this kind of violence. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an enormous task. Yeah. Now, you, you talked about, well, you mentioned military sciences. Brazil is a kind of a paradox, which is very interesting, right? Historically, we are very friendly, but it's not like that in terms, if you analyze a little bit more profound uh, our culture we are quite we like authority we are uh, this subtle violence in way that we treat other people even in terms of uh, grammar choices and we do have as well even though we are historically known for being neutral in in terms of war or uh, international affairs we do have a lot of a lot of military courses. In fact, there is an undergraduate course called Military Studies, and it's considered to be a, a university course. So you can graduate in that, and you have a, what we call it here, higher learning course, for example, university course, and you can work in many areas if you are graduated in that. And you have post-graduation, and so, so it's a paradox. We are neutral, neutral, right? But we we organize the knowledge around military. So there is a grammar question now. It's Professor Sara. She's she wonders if you found uh, the, the the engram our war, and if this engram was used as a positive reinforcement to, to 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 the population like war is good so that's why we say our war well let's see if we can um let me share my screen and we'll do a search of it okay so oh uh, yeah okay so i'm gonna share screen and put the engram viewer Okay, so Professor Sardas asked asked about this conjunction, our war. Yeah. Okay. So it's searching, and 
Sorry. Okay, so what do we see? A peak for World War One. Yeah, a peak for World War One. So peaking 1918 and peaking in 1942. Um, so there is a kind of, well, there's a lot of literature about the um, effect of war on nationalism. And there's a debate in the literature about whether nationalism makes war more likely um, or does war make nationalism more potent? You know, what's the relationship between nationalism and war? Um, <clears throat> this uh, finding certainly shows that conjunction between them. I don't know... I don't know that I have a view on which causes the other. Milosevic, the sociologist I mentioned, kind of argues that nationalism is just this constant uh, process of ideologisation. So we're constantly being constructed as national subjects and that that is part of the support for for what happens when you're government gets you involved in a war. Nationalism is this potent resource that they can make use of and we can see that spike in that conjunction happening during these two peaks in the 20th century. So I think the answer is yes to that question. So Professor Valera now, um, today I read an and I'll do near my house the following. Either stay free or die for Brazil. This excerpt is part of our independence anthem. Freedom is not won, it is taken. Do you see any similarity between what is written on this outdoor and your search results? We are not in a state of war, but our government is warlike. Well, actually, we are very afraid because... Uh, she, she put the question there. Because our president is doing like Trump did when the capital was invaded, using indirect, almost now. Now he actually he threatened our Supreme Court that in three days, four days, September the seventh, which is our Independence Day, uh, they will face the consequences. So, and again the. I'm kind of apprehensive about that. But anyway, her question is, she saw the, the author that she says, either stay free or die for Brazil, which is an excerpt uh, of our independence anthem. Freedom is not won, it is taken. Do you see any similarity between what is written on this outdoor and your search results? Thank you for that very interesting and depressing example okay so the expression to die for uh well I, I have obviously i have no intuitions about portuguese but certainly in english i know that the idea to die for is a very common expression and so it constructs a belief in and a commitment to the idea that some things are so important, you have to fight and die for them, right? Um, <clears throat> and re remember my comparison between to fight and die versus to fight and kill, okay? So that construct is about this idea there's a historian who says the origins of this kind of propaganda are about 5,000 years old. So there are some famous inscriptions um, which are an, an account of um, a battle by the Persian king in which there is a kind of narrativising of that story inscribed on cliffs um, in Iran, 
And so this historian says, okay, we can go back 5,000 years and see this willful propagandising around war in the service of the powerful maintaining their power. So it looks like we've got a long history of this um, attempt to reconcile, you know, violence with, you know, the things that we want about violence with the things that we don't want about uh, with that we don't want with violence. Uh, there's another historian that I've read who has written this amazing kind of 3,000 year history of war. Uh, and he talks about the period around the 10th, 11th centuries, where the major uh, religions, um, Jewish, Christian, and Islamic religions, all go through this struggle around trying to reconcile. Well, in the Christian tradition, it's the concept of a just war, okay? So you you want, you know, they, they want to be able to use violence to take property, to invade other countries, to proselytise, but they've got to find a way of legitimating it. So in the Christian religion, we have this concept of just war. For Muslims, there's a holy war, this kind of thing. So these semantics run incredibly deep. And that beautiful little neighbourhood example to die for Brazil. So Brazil is a modern concept, right? So Brazil's, I don't know, a few hundred years old and it's completely derivative. It's not natural. Its borders aren't natural. They're imposed. They're historical. Um, I mentioned Milosevic says nationalism is the most powerful ideology that we've ever developed. And, you know, to see it in the little neighbourhood, he, he talks about the power of ideology and that organised violence needs ideology. It needs uh, what he calls centrifugal ideologisation. Okay, so centrifugal meaning, okay, so a sending out from the centre and ideologisation, he's kind of coined this term to talk about these major centralised agencies who have the role of spreading the dominant ideologies. And he also talks about micro solidarity. So in our little homes and communities, we perform the function of perpetuating these ideologies by the ways that we talk to each other. And so a little sign like that, that you're gonna, just gonna walk past in your neighborhood is this combination of centrifugal ideologization being translated into this micro context. Um, so absolutely, absolutely, that is illustrative of this deep kind of spread. And again, I can't really sp speak about Portuguese because I haven't had the chance to see what these patterns might look like in Portuguese. But I've got every reason to think that the semantics of war and the legitimation of war, well, you know, you've had a history of military governments. So yeah. I expect that there would be very similar things if we looked in some corpora of uh, Portuguese. Now, I want to do that because I want to discover that as well. Uh, there is one last question here. Um, it's Professor, Professor Rodrigo. Uh, beyond, no, 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 here. How can teachers help students become more aware of ideology since it's mostly hidden in discourse? Uh, thanks for that fantastic question. Um, part of what I am also trying to do is 
to get more linguists involved in the study of ideology. Um, and I'm surprised by, I was surprised as I started to work in this field about how little, um, how little theoretical work had been done in linguistics on ideology. Now, there's been quite a bit of applied work in the field of critical discourse analysis, uh, but a lot of that, as I say, it's applied without trying to work out why language is so ideological. And I think we absolutely have to understand that problem. Um, so I would like to see linguistics take the problem of ideology much more seriously than it does. Um, and so I teach some of this work in my own teaching at Macquarie University. Uh, one of the problems is I think we have to talk differently to change the ideologies because ideologies are absolutely able to be changed. We know that that ideologies can change because even in, so, you know, I'm 55 and I've seen quite a bit of cultural change over my lifetime. Um, so a few years ago, finally, Australia changed its laws about marriage equality. So you could marry, marry someone regardless of whether they were the same gender as you or not. And you know, this was after a long history and a lot of public debate and sadly a lot of homophobia and this kind of thing. But finally, that has changed and that comes about by people talking differently and we have to kind of do it grassroots up because the people at the top, they're invested in things staying the same. And, yeah, so somehow we have to educate the educators so that they can encourage the kind of critical thinking that allows people to see behind these ideologies and to see who's making money out of these habituated ways of talking and thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, ideologies are quite, at least here in Brazil, of course, it's mostly studied in sociology, philosophy, history, da 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 uh but it's not for example because we have this category as licentiate courses in which you learn the language and you learn how to teach the language as well and normal which is sad is normally that our understanding of ideology comes from media because mm -hmm. part of a government uses which is very interesting he, they use the 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 concept of ideology uh, from the most traditional Marx concept ever, which ideology is a bad thing and we need to yeah. go, we need to find the truth. But they yeah. hate Marx as well because they hate communism, socialism. The name. So it's very ironic, to say mm -hmm. the least, uh, because uh, gender ideology is still used, the expression is still being used, or, or uh, uh, there is a word here, do uh, doctrinate, as they using in, in, in the USA as well. Oh, the mm. teachers will doctrinate our students, so they will become, yeah. you know, so it's interesting. Mm. Professor Annabelle, thank you so much for your lecture, because when we work with words and language and uh, the possibilities, I mean, if we, ch we if we, choose the words we want to depending on the context it says so much about our culture and sometimes we don't realize that until we mm. stop and look uh, at the choices we make or the choices the text have made uh, otherwise we we don't pay attention to that mm. Mm. so i want to thank you for this wonderful thank you so lecture. much for the invitation i was really um very happy to receive this invitation. Thank you. Yeah. Professor Diego, do you want to say something? Let's see if, if he's here. I think he's here. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, just to to end this conference, uh, I would like to thank you so much, Annabelle. It was a wonderful class. Uh, lots of people told that that um, in the chat on YouTube. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. It's really my pleasure. Uh, now in Portuguese, um, apenas para concluir, então, gostaria de agradecer muito a presença do Eric e da professora Anabel agora nessa, nessa mesa final, nessa conferência final do nosso evento. Uh, esse foi o terceiro congresso internacional em ensino de humanidades e linguagens. É um evento que foi iniciado no ano de 2017, continuado em 2019 e agora em 2021 a terceira edição. Então, agradeço muito a, a todas as pessoas que estiveram envolvidas, aos colegas que ajudaram na organização, especialmente a todos vocês que nos acompanharam, nos assistiram, estiveram o tempo todo aí conosco nessa edição que foi online. E logo nos próximos, nas próximas semanas, nós já começamos a pensar no nosso quarto congresso uh, que ocorrerá né, da mesma forma como os anteriores de dois, uh, daqui a dois anos. Então, em 2023, nós estaremos realizando o quarto congresso. Então, muito obrigado a todos e nos encontramos no próximo evento. Tchau, tchau. Boa noite. Tchau. Good night.